Creative Libraries Utah, we, we've had a little bit of a different experience just from the start because we did not um, sign up as a team. We were individual applicants and we're put together and we're, we started as a very small team. We've always been three. And we started talking, uh, we started calling each other since we didn't have a project lined up uh, a few weeks before we came here and got on the idea that we are all interested in accessible and open content. Um, I, I'm very, myself, personally very obsessed with uh, Creative Commons and other things that make information more accessible. Um, especially since the late 70s, we think we're in this information age where we have more and more resources, and, and, and in a way we do, but at the same time, copyright and other legal processes have actually made things more onerous as well. It's harder to, you know, get full access to things in certain ways than it ever has been before because copyright now is your lifetime plus 70 years if you're an individual and if you're a corporation it's it's I think 72 years I can't actually remember but it's it's become more onerous over time and what creative libraries Utah became to about us is open content and my thought has always been that anything that any of you are making that has been made with tax dollars you know whether you want credit or not and that's fine more or less should be put in the public domain almost immediately and what you'll see tr truthfully um, one of the things I love most about this this website is not only is it it's it's in the public domain anything and everything we put on here and we make sure people know this anything and everything on here you can do whatever you want with um, as Matt mentioned we do have a series of podcasts that you know has a lot of me talking on it and people can do whatever they want with my words because I have put them on the internet under the public domain because I feel like everything I do as a librarian is done with tax dollars and that has brought me to this place believing that more or less everything we do should be in the public domain or at least you know licensed op with open open access licenses through a company like Creative Commons um, or an organization such as Creative Commons um, but what we're really trying to do is create a conversation and create a place where all Utah libraries can publish uniquely created library materials. Every day in every library, people are creating things like book lists, they're creating pathfinders, uh, they're creating videos and presentations that are all done with, with state money. Um, you know, you're going to, Tegan and Kristen are going to walk through a lot of different things, but the other thing we're doing is also highlighting. I got a little cheeky and just, while everyone was working, this is something that we really are focused on too, is showing librarians what other libraries are doing. So, you know, without their permission, because I'm not really doing anything of theirs, it's a link, it's a little explanation, it goes to their website, I can highlight what utahauthorvisits.org is doing, and I think that's amazing. So every day um, we troll through other libraries' websites, we see what they're doing, we create posts about what are going, what's going on in other libraries to try to incite creativity among libraries and librarians. Um, the other thing that we've really done, um, we're asking people who create all of this content to contribute. And we're all librarians, so we're creating other content that we, we also contribute to the website. But we wanted something that the website itself was uniquely contributing. We were creating. And one of the things that we are creating that is content, and we take the broadest sense of the word content, we have, we have display ideas on here, we have reading lists on here, we have everything that you can imagine in this content, but we do a weekly podcast. We talk to librarians in Utah. We talk about what's going on in their libraries and really it focuses you know on library issues in general but we interview Utah librarians we have done some national speakers and things like that but you know we'll talk about this a little more later but you know we do different things um, this is something that Wanda Huffaker of the the Intellectual Freedom Committee has asked us to do to make sure that you know every once in a while we throw something up about challenged books and the resources because she feels that people are under-reporting challenged books in the state of Utah, um, especially when they're just kind of informally challenged and she thinks that's important. So we worked with, Han with Wanda, we created a post, we put it on our website, and then more traditionally we're just 
getting content from libraries. This was the Hurricane Branch of the Washington County Library. They sent us tons and tons of display ideas. This is the Park City Library, uh, an LA there named Jess has just, she, she gave us about 50 different story time plans and ideas that really, these, these ideas, you know, we, we create so many redundancies. I, you know, to some extent, I, I really think only one or two libraries in the state of Utah need to be working on book lists. And there's a lot of good ones out there. And you know, you can go to Provo City, Salt Lake County, and, and then once again, Sarah Hall does these amazing um, book lists. But book lists are about the same at all libraries. And if we weren't creating so many redundancies, if every single library in the state of Utah wasn't creating book lists, what we have is the time that we're always whining about that we don't have. We're so busy, we can't do all these things. Uh, if, if we eliminate creative redundancies, we have more time to actually then turn around and create other programs, create other opportunities. Um, so really this, 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 is, this has come out of, you know, the open access uh, movement that, that we are all very interested in. Um, that's a little bit of our background. This is the website, Creative Libraries Utah. There, we've, we hit the ground running. We, we had our website live, I think, the day after we got out of the first session of, of um, iLead. We put up our little robot video. We put our explanation. And we started asking people for content. Um, we, we, were, we were all on the same page. And it really didn't take too much effort. It's a WordPress website. Um, we just bought hosting from Bluehost, and we really hit the ground running. We opened our Twitter account. We, we got our creative libraries, Utah at gmail.com immediately. We kind of, I worked a little too much also during the actual last session. I, I probably should have paid, I mean the first session. I should have paid a little more attention to what everyone else was saying instead of creating logos and doing things like that. But really, we had a great opportunity to just hit the ground running, because what we really want to do is be facilitators. Um, and we, we've spent a lot of time trying to make those connections. And we'll talk about a lot of these in a little bit. Um, two things I want to highlight before we go is, and turn the time over to Tegan and Kristen is, um, you, you'll see this, the stats in a little bit. Right now we're averaging about 20 visits a day. Um, we have 2,081 all time. Our best day ever was 83. And our, you can see we actually kind of have a pattern that we've produced. You see 72 here and then a big day afterwards. Those are the days we actually release our podcasts. And the more well-known the individual we're interviewing on the podcast, the more visits we get. So you see right here, and just a, you know, a nice smile to Trish, this 83 day was our very first podcast. And it was with Trish Hull back there. And we also had a, a 61 right here with Trish. Um, but then we had somebody like Jim Cooper, and the more well-known the individual is, the better the site does. But you know, the site is growing well. We have a lot of growth. We've, we were, had a story written about us for TechSoup for Libraries that highlighted the, the website. We also have had a great partner in the Utah State Library and in the Utah Library Association, especially when we do something um, or talk about ULA a lot. We end up on their website. Um, Barbara Hopkins is very good about sending out an email. I'm sure some of you have seen that link to podcasts and other things like that. So we, we found a lot of really good partners in the state of Utah that are helping us to build this forum. Because truthfully, what we want this to be is a platform for all librarians. Um, we'll come back to me a little bit later, and I'll talk about more of my experience a little more. but. Um, I'll turn the time over to my, my partners here. So I wanted to kind of explain uh, our experience uh, and also how we got there, our vision, and why we came up with this. So I'm, I applied to iLead as an individual, and I found out that I got in before I officially got in because this gentleman from San Juan County calls me up and is like, I'm on your iLead team! <laughs> and that was Dustin, and he started mentioning open content and um, this idea of collaboration and sharing. And one of my little geek things is policy and also copyright law, so I was all about it and um, really appreciated someone who wanted to collaborate more with libraries and create a platform where we can all share. And so we started, um, 
like you guys experienced, you had to fill out a team application. So once we figured out what our um, project was going to be, we had to re-evaluate, um, like, so what are we doing? And put that down onto a team application. So it was kind of nice because I was new to Utah, so I dove into the Utah stats, and I discovered that a <laughs> ton of people visit Utah, um, and that inundates our libraries. So our libraries, you know, are only have so many um, staff members, but yet we're still here serving not only our community, but also world tourists that come and visit us. So what does this do to our staff time? How can we manage it more? How can we produce lists when we're, um, when we're all busy? So what can we do to make um, our jobs a little bit easier? And it can't just be about our jobs being easy. Um, what I also discovered was that Utah has, now it's going to change because this study was two years ago, um, only 40% of Utah schools have school librarians either full or part-time. So what can these people accomplish during their day when they're only there for um, part-time hours? How can we share our expertise so that we can help out students all across Utah um, navigate and develop 21st century literacy skills if they're missing the navigator within that school? How can we as a state, as fellow librarians and as experts in our field, help these students grow if they don't have access and they don't have a navigator within their school. So big ideas, big pictures, and how do we get it to like start? How do we do this? How can we bring everyone together? And our biggest success is going to be our colleagues um, believing in this dream. And so we hit the ground running because <laughs> we needed your support. Uh, so <laughs> we had to, um, sell this dream and we kind of hope everyone dreams in color with us so not only will our colleagues who can produce fabulous book lists share that with us so that we can um, uh, distribute those within our library so that our, our patrons benefit from other libraries work and other people's expertise but that also gives me time to create something for you um, that maybe could benefit your library and your patrons because libraries are only good as their librarians um, and we don't always have time to go out and, um, you know, do everything we want to do. There's only eight hours in a day. <laughs> so I oftentimes run out of time. So I wanted to create a time saver, but also a launch pad for us as a whole um, state to be more creative and to help our patrons and also the people who visit our libraries. So as we were working through this process, and realizing that we had this idea and we had this vision and it's huge, how do we break that down? And our, our big component of to make this successful is, again, our colleagues and your guys' support in the stream. So we hit the ground running because we needed buy-in. Um, what's in it for you? And we need to sell this idea so that <laughs> this can happen. Uh, so we applied right away uh, to get into ULA um, and I created this gigantic poster. Um, if you guys were at the poster session, it hung um, past the, uh, the board. And so just to kind of create this visibility of uh, Utah Creative Libraries to chat to people about our idea and to try to make connections. So again, I was new to Utah. This was an awesome opportunity to start networking and um, hopefully share an idea that everyone else would like to join me in. And then um, in our June session, so we really want to be open to like um, for academic librarians, book lists, cataloging. We really want this to be a place where anyone can put any type of content. And that's a big order. <laughs> uh, so how do you narrow it down and how do you discover your key stakeholders? So I'm with the Park City Library and I'm the Youth Services Librarian. And so I was like, I need to talk to my peeps. Um, so I went to, <laughs> I applied uh, to speak at YART and, um, the, sorry, I should say it, the Youth Services, you, no, Young Adults Roundtable and Children's Services um, Fall Workshop. And so I was just down there promoting not only I Lead USA because I got a lot out of it, but also promoting creative libraries. Um, and so what I wanted to also carry when I went down there is when people talk about producing content, everyone's thinking digital. Um, and so I think sometimes we get 
intimidated, well, I'm not producing anything, and here's some flyers that I made, and I'm not producing anything, and here's some story times that I'm doing, and I'm not producing anything, but really you are, and I want to give you a place, we wanted to give you a place to demonstrate this, and it doesn't have to be digital content. Um, the previous, uh, well, click with uh, my LA, her story times are all written out, and she's like, oh, you know, can I post this? I didn't type it. And I was like, no, we'll throw it up as a PDF. It's OK. You don't have to type it. We'll take it. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that everyone understood that, that we'll take any type of content, and it doesn't have to be like this perfect thing. Um, that way, because you're just leading someone else to uh, launch elsewhere. So sweet, I got a story time now. Now I can go make a different story time, and I can add that here so that we as collectively can um, keep building our resources and the knowledge. So what was really cool about going to that conference was that I was able to share um, everything that I want this to be. And this is what we got. Um, so they shared their book list. There's like 20 different book lists, and they're beautiful. And I can take this into my library, and I can be like, this is how I want our book list to, go, to be. Can you do it? Go. And then we can do other things. And what I thought was amazing, if we go to our stats, um, is when you pick out your key stakeholders. And word of mouth, if you look at it, this is our October. So <laughs> talking to people and sharing your ideas and finding your stakeholders and finding your peeps and sharing it, it really does bump up what your content can be and what your um, and what your goals are. So I found that really encouraging uh, when I saw our stats <laughs> because I was like, yay, um, we're getting somewhere and we're getting people all on board of um, and onto our vision. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen because she's done an awesome job, again, with trying to get more people um, interested in our project but also collaborating with each other. All right, so I'm Kristen Steele. I'm the resource sharing coordinator at the State Library. And one of those words in that title is sharing. So it's sort of been rooted in me all this time throughout this project that I just have this, I've been given this title to share, so I'm going to go for it. And starting out the iLead program, um, Dustin and I were in class. We are in the library science um, master's program. and. Adrian was talking it up quite a bit, and Dustin was really excited about it, and I was just sort of, sort of standing by and was like, oh, I don't really think that's me because I would just question, I, can I be a leader? I don't really see myself as a leader. Don't people that lead, aren't they like the top people? And you know, they do all the command and they direct. So for me, it was really an uh, investigation the whole time, the whole eight months. Um, starting out with the intercessions and um, just really touching on leadership and um, I had to grapple with it in an advocacy class also with Dustin. We had to um, focus on our strengths and weaknesses and kind of learn where we are just like some of these programs we've all done in this session. So um, through that journey I've taken interest to continuing education on my own and uh, branching off some of the intercessions that I took from Linkage, which is a uh, leadership development company online, and they had myriads of webinars to listen to, and that's where I did all my intercessions. And one that really stood out was uh, Brene Brown. She has a published book, Daring Greatly, if you've heard of her. And um, she just is kind of following one of those trends that, you know, women in leadership. And so I kind of took that route and have been still looking for other books. And one of my other favorites has been Enlightened Power, um, Transforming Leadership with Women. So in that book, there's um, 40 essays of real life situations where women have encountered dilemmas and problems in the workplace. and just watching how each of them, you know, use leadership skills. And so still, like, I haven't taken on one leadership style. I just keep learning because I just keep, you know, getting put in different positions in my career. So I feel like it's really important to be f flexible and learn from that. And so with that, um, 
jumping back to the beginning of this project, I you know, was puzzled about the idea of how are we gonna get information from all these people, you know, it's a really daunting task because you have to call them, you have to get the buy-in like Tegan was saying. And I started with Murray Library, I, I work there seasonally and I have worked with the coworkers there and um, I knew that they had a really strong teen programming in development so they just rolled out their new fall program of um, doing teen services for every single day, which is really hardcore in my opinion and it's grown to be really successful and um, you know I hear this a lot and I've seen this in a lot of my classes at Emporia that you know a lot of projects are centered around how do we control these teens they're driving us nuts they're disturbing patrons like we gotta do something we can't just hate on them we have to you know just work with them and so to me, that was one of my favorite projects, incorporating into this, and I'm trying to find it. I'm not used to these PCs, so I'm, I'll work with the mouse here. So, uh, uh, let's see. Well, as I look for it, and Dustin helps me. Um, Where it is now? Oh, we went back. I was able to obtain some things prior to the, the rollout of the new programming. Um, and let's see. And so Lindsay Royland, she's been helping me a lot with this, and she's also our community user. And so she's been able to, I can't work this thing. So anyway, um, Dustin, you could over here. <laughs> um, this is just a, a, an image of um, the program displays that they're using and, and basically what they're doing if you can read there is just they, they've incorporated games and Legos and movies and uh, teen advisory groups and writing classes and Lindsay's been able to give me um, full write-ups of how to do the program how much it's going to cost how much staff you need everything you can possibly think of so that you know when we hand this to someone else of interest and say here you want to do this program this is exactly how you can do it and so I have up here, there's tons of PDF documents, just outlines, and there will be more through Murray to read about. Um, another thing that I found really beneficial is uh, the instructional flyers for eBooks, because uh, as a state library employee, I know that a lot of libraries will call us with questions about how they can upload things to their, to their device. And so Murray put out these flyers for each individual device. And so, how do you use this mouse? You're fighting yourself. <laughs> anyway, they're just two-sided flyers. And so if a patron comes in, they, there's this big display and you take, you can download one of them. You just, you know, it's easy so the patron can just take what they need and if they need more assistance, then they can go to a staff at the desk and have them walk them through with their device hands on. So those have been really good. Um, one really important thing that I've been trying to focus in on is um, as a resource sharing coordinator, um, I had worked with interlibrary loans for a while. I was talking to all these people from all many rural libraries just having conversations about daily business and so I found this as an opportunity to extend communication with them say hey why not we have these conversations why don't we talk about what you're doing at your library and just start you know engaging in kind of what this website is about and so I was able to connect some of these things this content that we've gathered with libraries like Canab, way down by Arizona, they wanted to do a, um, a tie-dye event, so I was able to connect one of Murray's examples with them. And they also expressed interest in a one book, one community um, book group workshop, which several libraries have done, and I was able to connect her with Dustin's program down in Blanding. So to me, that's really important. It's the small things. It may not be, you know, how much usage we get on the site, but just to, you know, collaborate and connect everyone with the networks that I can. So that's been really a big thing for me. Um, and 
With that, I would like to thank Darcy for all of the help that you've given us and Juan for letting me go on consulting trips with you because I've learned through the service of consulting and training, um, which Colleen is also to thank through ch training workshops that I've seen how they have led and they've been really good examples for me, so thank you. And um, Craig is the best boss in the world. So yeah, you know, of course he is. So every time I've come into a bind, he's really helped me get through it. So that's that. You want to finish up? And truthfully, this presentation doesn't mean a whole lot unless it's, it's more or less a sales pitch at the same time. And we're asking the same thing of all of you that we ask of all Utah librarians. And it's really easy. You don't have to do anything. You're already creating things every day for your jobs. You're already doing exactly what this site is hoping people are doing. All you actually need to do is send an email. And you, you guys probably send at least 10 to 20 emails every day. It shouldn't be too hard to fit another one in there with links, with PDFs, with information that, you know, we don't even ask much of people. You can, da you can data dump this, this stuff on us to the Creative Libraries Utah gmail.com account. And, and, you know, I love this project. I, I can't even, there's probably been less than two or three days since March where I haven't worked on this website or worked on content or worked on things like that. I'm on here every single day. I'm on the email every single day. And if people send us stuff, it's, it's usually up on the website within an hour. And then we send them a link so that they can see how they're sharing in this, you know, attempt to build collaboration and to build creativity. So go back to your libraries and see what you can email us. See what you are, or you've already created that will benefit all of the other libraries because it's, it's so wasteful to keep it just in one organization. It's, you know, it's just, it's such a, such a loss to everyone else. Um, so I guess that's our final pitch and it's the pitch we're making to librarians and libraries across the state of Utah. And if you can take that forward with us, we're happy to help any of you with your projects as well. When you're, you know, We'd love to, for, to put a link to your accessible tutorials. We'd love to post your accessible tutorials. We'd love to post your video for anyone to see. We'd love to post anything that's created here and for the opportunity to help grow your projects because that's, you know, we more or less, a we are a facilitator. We want everyone else's projects to grow. We don't, the three of us work at libraries, but this isn't a library. This is a project that's meant to help all of the libraries that are already out there and that exist to avoid creative redundancies, to have more time and to be able to spend that time on other creations. Um, so come to creativelibrariesutah.org, um, go back to your libraries and really, really just, just dump things on me. I'll format them, I'll put them on the internet. You don't have to do anything but send an email and thank you for your time. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and truthfully, we've done some stuff for Utah State Library where they didn't want it to be uh, public domain. And when you look at it, it says public domain unless stated otherwise. And what we wrote for them was simply that they want attribution. So if you were going to use their thing directly, you would need to always give attribution to the Utah State Library. And we state those things, but no, all these things on there, we mostly put them up as PDFs. Um, so lots of the things are branded, and that's okay. Um, but whether or not your policies know it, with a lot of the laws from the Utah State Legislature, most of the stuff you guys are creating already belongs to the public domain. Whether, even if it's branded, we can come to your websites and, and take it whether or not you want us to because it's made with tax dollars. <laughs> Lorelai? Um, not, not particularly. We, we've mostly been with uh, young adult libraries, a lot of, a lot of book lists. Uh, um, the thing that we really just started doing was, was saying we're not going to wait for content either. So one day I was like, I wrote a blog post saying like these link to the, the Salt Lake County and the Provo City Library book list. Some of the best book lists I've ever seen. Don't waste your time making your own book list.
go 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 onto these websites, take whatever whatever you want, and then make you know give them some attribution, but then spend your time on something else. <laughs> Maddie. At one point, you and I talked about having you put up some best practices policies. Are you still planning on doing that? You know, I had policy examples up there for a little while, and it just uh, there was uh, there's only one or two in there just from my library. But I honestly that that. That we are willing to make a section. It's not hard for just about anything we get. We don't. We need to continue to refine so that it's not cumbersome. But at the same time, you know, anything a library is willing to give us, we will put it up. And what we do a lot of the time um, is we make a blog post first, and so it's like, oh, we just got these story time things. Check them out, and so it's in that, you know, the. The feed, but then we put them on a static page as well, so they kind of become part of an archive of, you know, content. content. <clears throat> I'll let one of you guys feel the question from Juan. <laughs> uh, I, I, I echo and, and I applaud the effort. I think the search feature needs to be very robust because I can see this thing growing. So in order to navigate and find those yeah. those feet, those nuggets, I think the search. Feature Fine. Right now, the, the site is curated, right? So you were emailing you stuff, and then you post it. Does that, are you concerned about uh, the burden on, on the three of you, if, if it is the three of you that will continue? I can speak to that. Um, so far, it hasn't been a burden, and the amount of time it takes to translate whatever they give us into a format that's good for the site, editing and all that, doesn't take that long between the three of us. So if in the case we get, you know, an Apple, sure. you know, whatever amount, um, it could be quite time consuming, but we can look at that later down the road. Okay. Let's hope <laughs> for it. Okay. I will happily work on this every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> like, without any... <laughs> So I, I'm not overly concerned. Trish, our favorite podcast. <laughs> well, and truthfully, Matt, Matt's, Matt's a fool. We did, we did a podcast yesterday, and it was posted. And it's, it's Matt talking about all of your projects and how great they are. He, he's a little embarrassed, but <laughs> it, it's great. Go ahead, Trish. So my question that is about the search. Um, when you do get things in PDF, are you? indexing them in any way so that they're searchable or not or I mean how ro how robust is the search well at the moment we've tagged everything that we've posted so you should be able to find it just with the website but for individual PDFs they're not indexed so that that will be to be determined on how far we want to go with it well and, and part of the reason they're they are that way is because most of the stuff we get is is often branded so you know, it, it's more of an idea database in, in, in that way because you can do it directly, but a lot of times you're going to have to, you know, instead of having to start at the beginning, you will have to create your own reading list that doesn't have the Washington County symbol on it. Um, so since things are branded, we usually post them as PDFs. Um, we can post them as searchable PDF, but mostly we're, we're relying upon tags and the in WordPress search engine, um, and it works, it works well. And, and truthfully, like, if we build a robust community, it's just we can be something akin to TechSoup for Libraries, where it's something you can just visit to catch good ideas just from the blog posts as well. Um, uh, you know, we, we post things every week. Besides, we do a podcast every week, but we, we almost put up, we put up articles, two, sometimes two or three every week as well, saying this is something good that we're seeing in the state of Utah, or even in Ohio, or places like this like this idea might be good for your library. So it, it really could be just used as a news source to some extent as well on that front page. Hello, welcome to Robots in Librarians, where we discuss the nuts and bolts of librarianship. I'm your host Turing O'Brien, tonight we have with us John Dewey Bot, the godfather of schematics. Greetings live forms. Also with us this evening Digital Pearl, the world's foremost artificial intelligence. Leave your grease cans at the door please. And last but not least, 
Louise Octavia Catalog. Yes, the Miss Catalog. Oh, please call me LOC. I'm bigger and better and happy to be here. Tonight, the panel will discuss robot collaboration and communication. Helping robots and libraries get outside the zeros and ones. So, fellow robots, what circuitry would be necessary for greater collaboration and communication? Collaboration is the key. Libraries must work together. I agree. Everyday robots create unique materials for libraries such as reading lists, pathfinders, and literacy programs. What if all libraries shared these resources? Share resources. It can't be done. It can be done. The real question is how. Movements such as Creative Commons and open software are creating a new and enviable standard of collaboration. I have recently heard of a new program called Creative Libraries Utah. Utah? You mean where I cannot buy alcohol or swim without rusting? Did anyone else just picture him in a speedo? Yes. I mean no. How about I just tell you about Creative Libraries Utah? Please do. Creative Libraries Utah wants all Utah libraries to contribute uniquely created library materials to their website. What would libraries gain from such a collaboration? Libraries will be able to avoid redundant efforts by embracing the expertise and resources of pooled library materials. It will also enable greater creativity. Instead of creating an already existing reading list, a librarian could focus on new programs and avenues of interest. So, if a library does not have Spanish language reading lists they could check for existing materials before creating their own? Precisely. Would libraries have to get permission to duplicate materials? Creative Libraries Utah will encourage libraries to publish uniquely created materials with Creative Commons copyright licenses. This would allow duplications and recreations as long as libraries give credit where credit is due. This is called attribution. Perhaps, you could give the audience another example of how this collaboration will work. Sure. Since the Rust Bowl, lots of schools were no longer able to staff their libraries. These schools can access pathfinders, reading lists, and other important resources from Creative Libraries Utah and their students will no longer be left behind. In earnest, anyone with connection to the Matrix will have access to Creative Libraries Utah. See how collaboration can result in better outcomes and lower costs. It seems like libraries will really be able to create more materials for less platinum, and that always makes the assembly line boards happy. Do you remember 50 years ago when Google said libraries were obsolete? I do. It makes me happy to see libraries continue to positively impact society. I would have never finished my art history degree without my local library. Collaboration is never obsolete. Final thoughts? Digital? Collaboration and community partnerships are the future. Making a decision to participate in a program such as Creative Libraries Utah should not be about immediate benefits for individual libraries. It should be about the future of libraries and their usefulness to communities as access points. Very nice. John Dweebot. I am just a small town robot who likes to put things on shelves. But it seems that the more Android Steve Jobs attacks libraries, the brighter they shine. And a constellation is always more exciting than a single star. No one shines brighter than you, except for maybe LOC. Collaboration allows robots and libraries to get outside their hard drive walls and create a large digital footprint. What an exciting opportunity and interesting network. Robots are programmed not to compute synergy, but programs like Creative Libraries you to make that very crashable. That is all our time ladies and processors. Our apologies to Matt D. Mann, we ran out of RAM.